Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you, almighty God. We thank you that there's always more, Lord. You want us to move from faith to faith and from glory to glory. You want us to be a people that love your word and love to obey your word. And whether that is the written word or you speaking directly to us to do something, you want us to be an obedient people. That's where your blessing is. That's where your power is. That's where your presence manifests. And so, Lord, we ask you to help us to hear your voice, to discern what you're saying to us individually and to the church. Help us to honor and respect your holy word that's in the scriptures that we have before us. Lord, your Bible you gave us and preserved. Lord, we pray, God, lead us and guide us into all truth. Lead us and guide us into your perfect will for our lives. I pray this today for everyone here, everyone watching and listening. I pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Yeah. It's a sword day. You know, I got this years ago because the Bible says what? The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And we're going to talk about the Word for a minute, the Word of God for today. And uh, it always helps people get a little bit of illustration, right? Now, I have swords and spears and knives that are really real, like, you know, stuff like that that'll cut you. But this one's just a replica, so everybody's safe today, all right? Um, but this is actually a rep replica of Carlos V of Spain, king that he ordered his Spanish Armada to carry. So this is a genuine replica of that. But um, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and then we're told what? The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So we're going to look at that today because I need to define some things. I seem to be getting a lot of messages messages about, you know, some things I've said about what it means to be born again, and I guess I need to clarify some things. But first, I want you to turn with me. We're going to read a couple of scripture passages just to introduce this, but everybody ought to know these. But let's go to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And this is vitally important. I'm just going to tell you right now, that if you don't believe that the Bible we have today, and I'm talking about the English translation, I'm talking about the King James Version that we have that came from the correct text and ancient manuscripts. If you don't believe the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant words of Almighty God, you call yourself Christian, I'm just going to tell you right now, you're either not born again or you have fallen away from the faith. You understand that that's the foundation. The foundation of our faith is believing the Bible is the Word of God. In fact, 1 Peter says that we are born again by the Word of God. And it was the Word of God that we heard because no man can come to Jesus without hearing the preaching or the ministry of the Word of God. So the Word of God is the sharp two-edged sword that pierces our hearts. Now, what I'm finding is a lot of Christians, that, uh, people rather, that claim to be Christians, but they don't really believe the entire Bible is the Word of God. I believe it's a lot of nice stories of, you know, moral truths, but not necessarily every word is important or every word is inspired. And these people are deceived, and these people are teaching our next generation of pastors to come. In fact, they actually invaded the seminaries many, many decades ago, the Jesuits, uh, priests, and assassins, they, they infiltrated the church and they infiltrated our seminaries. And they've been teaching this nonsense that the word, uh, the Bible is not necessarily all of it's the word of God. I, I love this. You know, what my former pastor, Dr. Larry Lee, you know, he had two PhDs, Southwestern Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, of course, he messed up and got baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and really just, he said while he was in seminary, everybody he laid hands on got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and uh, they, they, didn't, they were not happy about that at the Baptist seminary there in Fort Worth. 
Um, but he said in his graduate class, now his doctorate level graduate class back in the 70s now, they were teaching, for instance, the first 11 chapters of Genesis was a true myth. That's what they said, a true myth. The theological implications are true, but it's not necessarily the word of God. And uh, there probably wasn't ever a man named Noah, and there probably wasn't ever a man named Adam. And, of course, Larry Lee said, he raised his hand, and they called on him. He said, well, Jesus thought they were real, and Paul said they were real. And he goes, the professor said, well, they just didn't have the information we have today. I'm going to tell you right now that that person, whoever that professor was, was not a Christian. Yet he's teaching doctorate-level theology classes, right? And this was in the 70s. You want to wonder how bad it is now? Take a guess. You think it's any better? No, 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 no. Um, in fact, what I'm going to get, uh, one of the things I'm going to get into at Skyfall is I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you the history of the Bible and the, how the Jesuits came in. And basically, every, every new modern translation apart from this one right here, has been corrupted and stamped approval of the Roman Catholic Church. If you see, if you see the Roman Catholic Church promoting the Bible, I can go and tell you, you know it's wrong, all right? You just need to get that down in your head already, all right? Um, but here's what the Bible says here, what the Apostle Peter wrote down. We're going to read this. He said, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well, that you take heed unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first. Somebody say, knowing this first. Knowing this first. If you're a Christian, you better know this first. He says that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. And you could also say that is man's ideas. These were not man's ideas that are in this book. It says this very clearly, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, I've talked about this many times, but there's something I want to point out in this passage, but I want to get it, get it down here. This is what it says, 2 Timothy 3. We're going to go down to verse 15. Now, this is Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, teaching a young pastor to be, I believe, Timothy was really an apostle, but, you know, people want to argue with me about that. He says this to him, though, verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Somebody say the Holy Scriptures. The, Holy Scriptures. the written word of God. That's what he's talking about. And he says here, You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You see that? He's talking about connecting, knowing the scriptures, the holy scriptures, connecting it to making you wise so that you may be saved. All right? And then he says this, verse 16, all scripture. Somebody say all scripture. All scripture. That means Genesis to Revelation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, in the Greek, it will say, God breathed. Now, what that means, remember when Jesus, after he rose from the dead, and he walked up to his disciples, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He's talking about when he says, God breathed. Inspiration means God moved upon these men. He breathed upon them. He filled them. His Holy Spirit moved them to write down the words from the prophets of old and to the apostles and prophets of the New Testament. 
he moved on them by his spirit, and they wrote exactly, somebody say exactly, exactly what he wanted. And this is why Jesus made the statement in Mark 4, 4. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Somebody say every word. Every word word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every single word in the Holy Scriptures is inspired by God Almighty himself. And and these, these apostles and prophets are telling you, we did not just sit down and think up these things and decide to write them. Anybody that says, well, the Bible was just written by men, they're they're only half true. Yes, God used men to write the Bible, but he wrote it through them. Okay? Now, if you don't believe this, like I said, I'm going to keep saying this, you are either not a born-again Christian or you have completely fallen away from the faith. You are a heretic. You understand that? I don't care if you're a pastor right now. I don't care if you teach in a seminary. I don't care if you got a mega church. If that's what you believe, you are either not saved or you have fallen away from the faith. You departed from the faith. This is why. Listen to this. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Somebody say for doctrine. See, let me tell you something else here. When somebody starts saying that even some of the figurative language in the Bible, when they start saying that it's just poetry and not necessarily have literal meaning, like when we start talking about the descriptors of God's creation or something like that, let me explain something to you. In every single passage of Scripture, in every single word, there is profitable doctrine. Amen? Amen. So don't tell me a verse describing the pillars of the earth. There's no truth to that. Or that the earth is still and it rests. Or that it's the sun that goes around us and not us around the sun. Don't tell me that's just figurative. That's just poetic. You have departed from the faith. It's simple. Don't tell me that the firmament is outer space. It's this big expanse of outer space. When God said he made a firmament that covers the earth, that has windows and doors, it opened up to let water from above come down and help flood the earth in the days of Noah. Now you either believe that, you believe the word of God, or you don't. And if you don't, you say you're a believer, and yet you don't believe those things, then you've departed from the faith. Oh, it's getting, don't get quiet in here. (laughs) You cannot have true faith in God, in our Lord Jesus Christ, and be walking with him in the spirit and in obedience if you don't have this foundational truth established in you. You see, I remember, I remember when I was 11 years old down here at Northside Baptist Church and the Holy Spirit came on me and convicted me and opened my eyes to the truth. And you know what the Holy Spirit made me realize immediately? As an 11-year-old child, I knew the Bible was true. There was a heaven. There was a hell. That I was a sinner. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that I needed to repent. I needed to ask Jesus to come into my heart to forgive my sins, to be my Lord and Savior. I had to confess him before men, as the scripture says. All of that came to me by the Holy Spirit. I can tell you right now, I sat in that church for a year and heard all kinds of preaching and nothing got through to me. But when the Holy Spirit anointed an evangelist that came through... I immediately knew the word of God was the truth and that Jesus was the way and the truth and the life. And I was so moved by that and so convicted by that that even though as an 11-year-old, you know, getting close to being a teenager, I was scared to death to do anything up in front of my peers. And I had all kinds of my friends that went to this church. We all sat in the back row and passed notes. That's what we did during church. 
You know, we didn't have text messages back then. We actually had to write little notes and pass them down the line. And, you know, back then, it's, if your parents caught you, then you were oh, you're in trouble. But see, since we sat in the back row, our parents were always in rows ahead of us. So we, we got away with a lot, right? But I remember sitting back there and the Holy Spirit so moving me. It was so powerful that I finally got the courage to say, you know what? I, I know I need to publicly go forward and confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Why? Because that's what the scripture says to do. There's no secret Christians yet. There's no closet Christians. You must confess him before men. You must not be ashamed of him or ashamed of the gospel or ashamed of the word of God. And I remember I let go of that pew. I was, I was they say, say old saying, I was white knuckling it, right? I was kind of holding on to it because I was scared to death. I'd never walked up in front of church in my life. But I walked down that aisle, and I remember when I stepped out of the aisle, the glory of God and the presence of God hit me. And I was born again, the tears running down my face. And let me just tell you, even though after that, you know, my parents divorced and we quit going to church, and I gradually got into my teenage years and fell away from God because I really didn't learn anything about walking with him. And... And, and let me just tell you, you know, as I, as I fell away from him, the, the blindness came over me. A spiritual blindness came over me that was very strange because I, I, the devil made sure, the demons made sure I'd never really even thought about God, never thought about the Bible. And what was amazing, in those seven years I was away from him in my teenage years, no one came to talk to me about Jesus. And the first person that did when I was 19 years old, it was like turn the light back on. But here's what's wild. I was in college at Troy State University, which is now Troy. And I, was, I had joined Sigma Chi fraternity, and I had a big brother in the fraternity. And I remember he and I riding around one day down in Vero Beach, Florida. It was where he's from. We went down there. And we're riding around in his car, drinking beer. We're not drunk yet, but we're starting to drink some beer. And... He starts talking about he doesn't necessarily, he doesn't believe in the Bible's true, and he just doesn't believe it. He used to, but he didn't believe that anymore. And I started, I, this, this anger, this fire started rising up in me. And back then, you know, I was quite the, the fighter, you know, and so was he. And I started, I, I, I don't even know where it came from. It was just, I guess, the Holy Spirit. I just said, look, man, I said, I think you just need to shut up. I said, because one thing I know, I said, I know the Bible's true, and I know Jesus is real. And I said that to him while we're drinking beer. But what I'm saying is I, I was so convicted and convinced by the Holy Spirit when I was younger, when I got born again, that there's no one. There was no atheist argument. There was no talking me out of it. You're too late. I was born again because I was convinced the Bible is the word of God. Therefore, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Savior, God Almighty in the flesh, and the only way your sins can be forgiven, the only way you can have eternal life, the only way you can escape the condemnation of hell, as Sal talked about last week. The only way. And this is what I'm talking about is this is foundational. Faith, what does it say? Well, let's go to Romans. Romans uh, chapter 10. Look, let's look at verse 9. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto the, to all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Somebody say obeyed the gospel. This is what you need to understand. The word believe in the Bible means to trust and to continue in a relationship and a walk with the Lord. That's why he says obey. Those are interchangeable, believe and obey, and we're going to get to that in a second. But very important, he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Verse 17, for then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Does everybody see that? The word of God. That's even how faith is stirred up. It's the hearing of the word of God, hearing it preached. Now, sometimes, granted, you may not be a person that ends up preaching it to you. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has to come directly to you, but he's going to give you the scriptures. And let me just say this out front right now. The Holy Spirit will never tell you anything that's contrary to the written word of God. Amen. You understand? He will never violate it. He will never go against it. He will never diminish it in any way. Okay. If, if a spirit comes along talking like that, something that's contrary, something that's leading off the scriptures, I don't care if it's a little bit. It's the devil. You understand? It's a demon spirit. And you better not listen to these, what, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's what he says. They will, they will come. Now, I want to tell you this right now. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 5. And I will tell you what, I was up till 5 o'clock this morning praying about this, and the Holy Spirit gave me this. So this is for somebody today. I know for that for a fact. Because if you're not obedient, you can forget everything else. And being obedient is not following your human emotions. Y'all understand that? Too many of you are led by your emotions and not by the Bible, the Scriptures, and the Holy Spirit. You're led by how you feel. You're led by, this is, why, this is why so many people out there and some people in here are so easily manipulated by other people. Because you're emotional, you let your emotions, now emotions are real, but they are not supposed, as a born-again Christian, they are not supposed to lead you. No more than your fleshly feelings and desires are to lead you. You are to crucify those things and obey the word of God and obey the leading of the Holy Spirit, period. That's it. You are, as a born-again Christian, to do the will of God. Now, let me say this, too, uh, being born again. Some people have gotten that, been out of shape because I talk about you should know that you're born again. Now, I don't know why they get bent out of shape because... You know, I talk about my experience in the Baptist church down here when I was young. And some people say, well, I didn't have that ex same experience. Well, you, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but let me tell you what needs to happen. If you come to Jesus, if you repent of your sin, if you make Jesus Lord of your life, if you believe he is God in the flesh, if you believe the scriptures are inspired by God, if you believe the right things and you call upon him with the full desire to follow him and to turn from sin and evil, then at some point there should be, as the Bible says in Romans 8, a witness of the Holy Spirit in you. Now, it may be gentle, peaceful. It may be just a knowing, a revelation. It may be he hits you hard, okay? I don't, it, it's not how it happens. It's just that you better know that you know that you know from the Holy Spirit that you are born again. And if not, then you need to be seeking Jesus until he gives you the witness of the Holy Spirit. Don't get mad at me. I get people sometimes, I got this one guy that got mad at me because he's, he's calling me wanting to be baptized. And I'm saying, well, are you born again? And then his answer was not sufficient. Right? His answer was didn't make sense. And when I don't get a clear answer, I'm like, well, you're probably not born again. And so when I began to explain to him what born again means, he got even more upset with me. Because, see, there's a lot of people that think, well, oh, if I just get baptized in water, that means I'm saved. 
See, this is, some, this is another stupid Catholic doctrine that's kind of trickled over into the church. No, water baptism does not save you. You must be born again. Water baptism is an outward evidence you going to be baptized in obedience after you've been saved. This is what I, I try to get across to people. But if, if you don't know, if somebody comes and tells me, well, I don't know. I don't know if I've been born again. What do you want me to tell you? You are? You want me to lie to you? I, I have a friend that wants to be saved. He, he even says to me, I wish I was like you and, and my other buddies that I led to the Lord many years. He said, I wish I was like y'all. I don't know what it is. I mean, I, I know some of it. But I think a part of it is, is that somewhere in all of his schooling and all of his upbringing, he just can't accept the Bible is the word of God. He can't accept, he's listened to the lies of the world, and he can't accept the Bible to be the truth and to be the inspired word of God, almost no matter what I say, no matter what evidence I show him. And I'm actually sad for him because it's like he wants his life to be more like mine, but he can't do it because he won't believe the word of God. And that's the first step. You have to know. You have to, look, God said in here, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. Psalm 12, he said, the Lord will preserve his word to all generations. And don't tell me, don't tell me you believe there's a God, but he couldn't preserve a book with his words in it. He could create heavens and the earth. He could make the human eyeball. But he could not somehow keep his word pure and stop men from corrupting it all. He, now, he didn't say they wouldn't change it. They change it and make all kind of different versions. Boy, if you, and then two, if you're, if you're using the message or the passion or the living by, Lord, that's not the word of God. We wonder why there's a lack of faith right now. There's a lack of faith in the church and a lack of obedience in the church because there's a lack of scriptures in the church. If you're using the NIV, you're using a corrupted version. We wonder, faith comes by hearing the word. If you're listening to the NIV, you are not hearing the word. The, the NIV is missing 10,000 words that are in the original Hebrew and Greek text. 10,000 words. That's an entire book of Romans. Now, how can you tell me that's the same Bible as this one? It is not. I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have a King James Bible, you better get one. Y'all going to find out at Skyfall just how amazing this King James translation really is. You're going to find out. So I'm done having it. People, everybody's not, it's like a war against the King James now. Oh, and the people that go, yeah, King James changed about. King James never touched it. He commissioned a bunch of scholars across England and in different parts of Europe, Hebrew and Greek scholars, to make a translation, a better one than the Geneva Bible. Yes, it's better than the Geneva Bible. And I'm going to go through that too. And we, we're going to cover Skyfall. You're going to get a lesson on the Bible. That's going to be part of Skyfall. Okay. So maybe this is just a warm-up right here. But here's what the scriptures say. Here, I'm going to read this to you. Hebrews chapter 5. It's going to hurt somebody. Verse 8. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And he's talking about the humanity side of Jesus had to go through suffering. And the Bible says he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. But he went through being tempted, being attacked by the devil, struggles. Being, he, he faced all the same human struggles that we face. Yet he was able, because he was God in the flesh, he was able to resist and live perfectly holy so he could become the spotless, sinless lamb of God, the sacrifice for our sins. But he says here, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, 
He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Did he say them that just believe and say a little prayer? Did he say them that are baptized in water? No, he said he becomes the author of eternal salvation. How many want eternal salvation with God? How many of you want to miss the judgment and the damnation? Okay, that's pretty good. Most of you. Um, I'm, I'm joking. But he says here, being made perfect, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now, the word obey here in the Greek, the, the Greek verb tense here, guess what it is? Present tense. Matter of fact, my Bible has PPT beside the word, meaning present participle. That means what, students? Ongoing, continuous action taking place in the present. So what he's saying there is Jesus is the author, the beginner, right? That's where you start. The author of eternal salvation to those who obey him continually. That keep it up to date. Right? You see, my life has been a life of just, Lord, what's next? What do you want me to do next? And that's why I have fun being a Christian. Now, it's not always easy, the things he's asked me to do. But boy, let me tell you what. There's been some interesting things that's happened over the years. I mean, just simple as, you know, I, uh, last year asking Greg Locke to come speak at our conference. Boy, I caught a lot of hell over that, but the Holy Spirit told me to do that. Well, if I hadn't have done that, then we probably wouldn't have had the situation where he challenged me to a debate that reached, I believe, into the millions of people. And you would not believe how many people say, you opened my eyes to the truth of God's word. It changed my life. So this is why you obey. I, I cannot stress to you, you have to be a Christian. If you want to bear fruit, if you want to walk closely to the Lord, if you want to see the miraculous, if you want to be anointed and you want to be blessed, you have to be obedient, period. And that means even if it's difficult, even if there's suffering involved, even if there's, you know, it's, un, it's very uncomfortable to you. Let me tell you right now, it was very uncomfortable. The spiritual warfare I went through leading up to the debate, the great debate on creation with Greg, the spiritual warfare I went through was, was unbelievable. And I was most uncomfortable for several weeks. And especially, oh, I remember arriving in Tennessee, oh, just the battle I was going through too, right? And I knew he was going to turn nasty on me. The Holy Spirit warned me. And yet, I knew he wanted me to do it. You understand? And it wasn't for me. I knew the Lord wanted me there, the Holy Spirit wanted me there, to be a light and a witness to many that would never hear otherwise. So I put up with all of that crap because I knew the Lord wanted me to be there. The same when I ran for governor of Alabama in 2020, from 2020 to 2022. I got criticized. Why are you getting involved in politics? Christians shouldn't be in politics. And I'm like, I don't care what you think. These people get their ideas in their head or their emotions or their opinions. I don't care what your opinion is. I'm going to pray and fast and do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do because I know that's where the blessing is, that's where the anointing is, and that's where I'm going to reach the most people. And if the Lord wants to send me into that dark world to be a light and a witness to them, I will go. You understand? I've had the Lord tell me not just to go in politics, but he has sent me into the deep, dark projects where gunshots were over here and gunshots over there. And I'm on this street preaching to, to people about Jesus. I'll go wherever he tells me to go. The Middle East, Africa, a little island out in the Indian Ocean. If the Lord tells me to go, I go. Whether it's convenient for me, whether I feel like going, 
I've been in situations where my life was in danger. But if the Lord tells me to go, I'm going to go. And this is the way we're supposed to be. I don't understand Christians that do nothing but go to church once in a while. Right? They might read their Bible once in a while. They might, right? But there's no hunger and desire to go, God, what is your plan for my life? What do you want me to do right now? Is there something that I can do to let my light shine to the world around me? I feel, you know, if you feel like you're in a rut, guess what? It's time to pray and fast. Say, Lord, let's, let's have an adventure together. Let's do something. I guarantee you he's got something for you to do that you never dreamed you would do. I remember when he told me to start going into the prisons way back. And that was powerful when I started preaching in prisons. And preaching in prisons taught me how to preach. It was that experience that taught me how to really preach and teach. I would be in big chapels full of prisoners that would come in with no microphone, no sound system, and have to preach. And, and I learned how to preach without straightening my voice every time. And it was powerful. I, I, I would go to Tutwiler. I would go to, down to Ventress Prison here. I mean, it was God just moved. But, you know, sometimes it was difficult. The spiritual warfare leading up to going to the prison. The devil trying to stop us. Stupid things happening. You know, there'd be uproars in the prison. We don't know if we're going to let y'all in or not. Oh, and by the way, if, it, if, if a riot goes down, you're stuck. We ain't coming to get you. I mean, that's what they tell us, stuff like that. You know, you're just stuck in there. Better hope they have mercy on the Christians, right? I found one thing amazing is that no matter, I, I mean, I was around murderers and everything else, and you know, but they respected, they respected the people that came in there to, and the, taking their time to come share the word of God with them. Uh, even, even, in the, even in some of the worst projects in Montgomery, we would have people, I remember walking up to a couple of guys and we're talking and then there's some other people walked up, and we, I mean, I'm telling you, we hear gunshots over here, and we're talking to these people. And, but because we had been coming down there and trying to, you know, bless the children in that area, we'd come do sidewalk Sunday school and pass out candy and sit there and hug the little kids. And a lot of them didn't even have, you know, they didn't have a normal home life. And I remember, you know, we walked up, and this two guys are like, we just got out of prison, man. And I was like, what what'd y'all do? Well, one was rape, and the other one was murder or something or aggravated assault and some guy came up and started kind of giving us a little hard time just started running his mouth and there's two guys now that just got out of prison so, man you need to shut up they told that guy said you need to shut your mouth these people are here to give us the word of god and they care about us see you'll you'll have you'll have unsaved wicked people take up for you if you're loving people and letting your light shine to people and if you're obedient. Man, I've been shot at. I've heard bullets go by my ear. I've had knives pulled on me. I've had guns pointed in my face. I'm still here. See, I'm not afraid. And that's another thing. If you're truly born again, you got you nothing to be afraid of. You afraid to die? No. I'm not afraid to die. I'm, I'm to tell you the truth, it'd be a great day. His body, shake off his old 56-year-old body and get a new, you know, just get, get out of it. I heard, you know, I heard people, my, my former mother-in-law, she had a 29, but she, she died in the hospital of pneumonia. So she remembers floating up out of the room and could see them working on her and everything. She said, but she was, said she had pneumonia so bad her whole body was just racked with pain. And she said the moment that her spirit came out of her body and she was headed toward heaven, she said all pain was gone. She said she got up there and the Lord walked down and said, mm -mm, you got to go back. She said the moment, she said, she remember coming right back straight down back into her body. She said the moment she entered back in her body, the pain, the pain, but she was alive. And I want to tell you, it, that's not going to be a bad day when it's our time to go. Amen? Now I want you to go with me, go to Luke. Chapter 5. Because this is a lesson the Lord was teaching the disciples very early on. 
And this is something that's interesting about this. He did this at the beginning of his ministry, and he did a very similar thing at the, at, after his resurrection and right before he left them and ascended to heaven. He gave them the same lesson. All right? Let's read this. This is Luke chapter 5, verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, upon Jesus, meaning the crowd was pressing in on him, to what? Hear the word of God. He stood by the lake Genezaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's or Peter's ship, prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land and sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, when he had left speaking or finished speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought or for a catch. Now, some people say, well, he was trying to reward Peter for letting him use his boat. Maybe so, but I think more importantly, he was going to use this moment to teach them a vital lesson. This is the vital lesson. So Jesus gives them a command. Launch out into the deep. Go back out with us. Go back out. I've been there. I've been across that. I took a boat across that whole lake. Sea of Galilee now, it's called. So I've been swimming in it. I've taken a boat across it. But he says, what he's talking about, let's go out where it's deeper and throw down your nets again to catch some fish. And here Simon Peter answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now let me just go and tell you. I've, I've preached on this before, but I'm going to say it again. When you have fished all night and you hadn't caught a thing, the last thing that you want to do that you feel like doing is go fishing again. You done brought the boat in. You're cleaning your nets. You've stayed up all night. Let me tell you what you want to do. You want to go home and crawl in the bed and pass out for a, a nice eight-hour nap. And see, what Peter was displaying there was, uh, you know, Lord, we we fished all night. We got nothing. The fish, we can't even find them. We don't know where they are. And these are professional fishermen. We didn't catch a thing. And the Lord says, go, let your nets down. And so Peter says, we've toiled all night. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, they said, I'm, we're just going to do it because you said to do it. We don't feel like it. Oh, man, if people could get this, we wouldn't have people missing church all the time. How many people that, oh, I don't feel like it this morning. Well, guess what? Most mornings, I don't feel like it either on Sunday morning, but I get up and come anyway. And most of the time, if the devil's trying to make you stay home, is the exact morning you better go. Because obviously, God has something for you, and the devil wants you to miss it. But he says, nevertheless, at your word, Lord, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. Now, that's a lot of fish. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the drought of the fishes which were taken. And, and so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon, and Jesus said unto them, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. See, they learned the lesson. What Jesus was teaching them, you do what I say. No matter how you feel about it, no matter if you're exhausted, no matter if you're wore out, no matter if you say, Lord, I've done it a million times. I did it all night long. And the Lord said, do it again. If you will obey and be an obedient Christian, that is where you're going to reach the most fish, the most people. 
That's where you're going to touch the most lives. That's where you're going to see the most power. You understand? This is why you, you, know, you, you don't lean to your own understanding. You just do what the scriptures say and what God's leading you to do. And let me just go on and add this to you. You've got to know the voice of the Lord and learn to be discerning of his voice and his direction because, like I've shared many times, not everything that he's going to tell you to do is written in here. But you have to know this so you can know if it's misleading you or not. And you have to know the witness and touch of the Holy Spirit so you can know when God's telling you to do something that's not necessarily written in here, like Dean start a church in Opelika. That's not in the Bible. But you have to know that's what he's telling you to do by his hearing his voice and the witness of the Holy Spirit, the same witness that you felt and experienced when you got saved. But I cannot tell you how important. If I could get, let me tell you, we, we talk about we want revival, and we want God to move, and we want to reach people. And then you won't obey him when he tells you to do something. He tells you to walk across the street and talk to your neighbor about Jesus, and you're scared that anyone can't do it. He tells you in the grocery store, you know, you need to talk to that person. You don't do it. But you won't come to church on Wednesday night and pray for revival? Let me tell you something. Before there's a revival, you got to be a revival. Because what a revival is, is when enough people in the, in the church get on fire and start just obeying him, that he moves. That's all there is to it. I, I, if... <laughs> If you say, Pastor Dean, what, what is revival? And you know one of the greatest revival that ever was, the evangelist Charles Finney. He said, revival is nothing else than, than believers. He said, it's a new beginning of obedience to God. That's it. He, he said, when Christians start acting like they're Christians, oh, novel idea, huh? That we should live what we say we believe. And see, this is why a few weeks ago I talked about fear. There's two competing issues. One is faith and one is fear. And you cannot walk in faith and be in fear. You, can, you will let fear rule you or you will overcome it through faith. Faith is obedience. Let me, let me tell you what courage is. You ask any of our heroes, our war heroes, you ask them, were you afraid? Of course. They'll say, yes, I was afraid. But they charged forward anyway. See, that's the thing about it. It's not that we're not going to have fear hit us sometimes. Sometimes even we're going to feel the devil's going to hit us with his, his terror, that feeling of just unrealistic fear but it's when you say God said to do this therefore I don't care how I feel I'm pressing through this and doing it anyway that's courage and boy do we need some courageous Christians now the world's getting darker and darker, and let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to be swept away with the darkness just like the rest of the wicked, or you're going to stand up to it and resist it and speak against it and fight against it. You're going to have to choose. And it's all going to come down to when you stand before God. He's not going to ask you what church you went to, how many times you were baptized, did you have your, your choir robe, you know, ironed. The question will be when you stand before him, did you walk with him? Did you obey him? When you stand there, you better be able to say, I did what you wanted me to do, Lord. The best that I could. And he knows 
if you're doing the best you can or you're playing a game. He know you're not fool you might fool the preacher, you might fool your spouse, you might fool yourself. You're not going to fool him. And this is what I'm talking about. We've got to have what? A heart that wants to obey. And if you do, let me tell you, if you do, you're going to see. It may take some time, but as you begin a life of just obedience to the Word of God and to what the Spirit leads you to do, you're going to begin to see the fruit come forth. The fruit of people coming to Jesus through what you say to them. Your prayers. Your example. You're going to find people that... Sometimes it takes a while because they're watching you to see if you actually live it. And then they're going to come to you and go, you know what? Like at like work. How many of you ever had somebody come up to work and said, you know, I've been watching you. I know you're different. Why, what is it about you? Or maybe they know you're a Christian and they've seen you get tested and you, when, you know, you didn't cuss the boss out. When they would have cussed him up one side down the other, right? And they saw you just be humble, respect authority, take it, do your job, do above and beyond your job. And they go, why do you, why do you act like that? Or they'll come to you and say, you know what? I know you're a real Christian because we've been watching you. That is what's important, y'all. I love the scripture in Acts chapter, go to Acts chapter 7. You want to upset some religious folks, this is how to do it right here. This, this got Stephen Stone for sure right here. You know, they had, they, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had snatched up Stephen. Of course, Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul, was part of this arrest. And standing there as he stoned to death, they stoned Stephen, the man of God, to death. But what was powerful about this is as he's preaching in Acts chapter 7, you can read it for yourself, all of it later, when he's, he preaches this entire sermon of, and, this, and he goes through some of the Old Testament prophecies and he points to, he uses some of the Old Testament prophecies to point to Jesus being the Messiah, which they didn't want to hear, right? They'd already killed Jesus and tried to get rid of him. That didn't work. Now these apostles are doing the same thing that Jesus was doing, preaching the same thing, preaching to Jesus, preaching repentance, preaching Jesus the Messiah, and they're just like freaking out. And Stephen's doing miracles and preaching the word, and they're like, we got to shut this guy down. So they brought in false accusers, accused him falsely. But then he preaches this whole sermon to them. And I love this when he gets down to this point. Verse 51, when he tells them, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Mm. Everybody see that? And then he tells them this. He said, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom... Ye now have been betrayers and murderers who received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed upon him with their teeth. Cut to the heart. He was telling them, you, you receive the law, you don't obey it. You think you know the Bible, but you don't even see the prophecies of the Messiah, the just one. You murdered him. And then what does the scripture tell us? God gives the Holy Spirit to who? Those who obey him. Man, I can't. I can't talk about this enough. Testing, all right. When we start talking about these things, we start talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, when we start talking about obeying God, man, 
it would just transform everything. There'd be a lot less people getting offended. Because you'd go pray about something, fast about something, and if you were listening, the Holy Spirit would tell you, and you would be getting mad at Pastor Dean. You know, sometimes you're in a big fight with your spouse. Best thing, you could go pray about it. Go sit down and just pray for a few minutes. You know, the Lord might say, you need to go apologize. You need to admit you're wrong. Well, you mean I was wrong? <laughs> yes. You little angel, you might be wrong. Right? Obedience. You know, it's Psalm 68. Let you go there. Y'all don't mind going to a few scriptures, do you? Psalm 68. I remember the Lord giving me this one time. And when the Lord directs you to a scripture and it hits you like a baseball bat, it's always a good lesson. I remember the Lord, I, and I've shared this before, the Lord told me, he told me to go give a word, a prophecy he had given me to this Methodist church, and I didn't want to do it. Did not want to do it. No part in me wanted to do it. And that fear, that terror, the devil would hit me, and just, I remember, and I remember I was there on a Sunday morning, because the Lord had me in that church for about two years, and I was there, and the church was usually packed. And I remember when the Holy Spirit goes, I want, I want you to give the word now on a Sunday morning. And I didn't do it. Oh, let me tell you. Tell you what happens to your spiritual life. You want me to tell you what happens? It dries up like bones in a desert. Let me read this. Thread. And the Lord directed me. He said, he said to me, go read Psalm 68. I start reading Psalm 68, and I get down to verse 6. It says here, God setteth the solitary in families, and he bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. See, for about three weeks, I disobeyed him. And let me just tell you, my spiritual life dried up. It was difficult to pray it was difficult to read it was like he shut the windows of heaven and there was like an iron brass heavens over my head it was like he departed from me and i'm i'm sitting there going what is this and i remember praying about things and let me tell you something about the lord when you haven't obeyed something that you know he's told you to do or you're disobeying something in the Word, don't be talking to him about other stuff because he ain't going to listen to you. Because he's, he's like this. He's just like any parent. You go do what I told you to do, and then let us talk. Oh, I can't tell you how many times he's told me, quit praying and go obey me. <gasps> you mean the Lord would say quit? Oh, yeah. That's what he told Joshua. Remember? When Achan took the, the garments and the gold and silver and he took it in his tents and then they went to the town of ai to that's interesting ai but they went to the town and 36 soldiers of israel died that day and joshua throws himself on his face praying and the lord said get up ain't no sense to pray you need to go deal with the problem go deal with this person because they brought a curse upon the whole camp Well, I can't tell you how many times the Lord's like, why are you talking to me about all this other stuff when I told you to do this? Recently, there's been a couple of things. And I've had this wrestling match with the Lord over a couple of things that I prayed and prayed and prayed about confirmation, right? He had already told me. Like, he had spoken to me. I'd felt the witness of his spirit 
I knew it was him. Confirmations from other people, God using other people to bring confirmations in my, I still didn't want to do it. And I remember this, this period has been a struggle. It's been dryness and difficulty. And, you know, as a pastor, I got all kind of things going on. So I got to counsel people and deliverances and all this stuff, trying to prepare for the conference. And I'm, so I got, all, I got a lot of stuff to do. And the Lord's like, go do what I told you to do. And then there was another thing that I'm not getting into this morning, but he's told me to do. And I've been praying about it. Like, oh, I need confirmation. Lord, I need confirmation. I need confirmation. And you know what was amazing? I kept praying, Lord, I really, 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 really need you to confirm. I need to know for sure. Right? Everybody been there? But see, when he told me about a year and a half before, the Holy Spirit came all over me. And he spoke to me, you're going to do this, 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 and this. So really, when he speaks to you and he confirms it by the witness of his spirit, he really doesn't have to tell you again. And he really doesn't have to cater to your insecurities and emotional instability or your fear or whatever your reason that you don't want to do it or you're wanting to doubt it. Because when he finally confirmed to me that I was supposed to do it, I mean, he did give me a confirmation, but I could tell it was out of just kind of, um, because you keep bugging me, I'm going to give you one. This is me and the Lord, because he's very straightforward with me. And he was like, all right, I'm giving this to you. And then he told me this. I heard him as plain as day. He said, here's your confirmation. But I already told you what to do. You know what you're supposed to do. So get busy. I'm like, oh, God. And there's that, that part where Peter says, you know, depart from me. I'm a, I'm a sinful man. There's that conviction because you know you just are being a little bit difficult with him. See, Peter wasn't being wicked, but he's being a little difficult. He didn't want to go fishing anymore. He was exhausted, discouraged. You know, fishermen, they don't catch any fish. They're not happy about that. Especially when you put in all that work for hours all night long and you catch nothing and the Lord said, go fishing again. See, and this is another thing. The Lord does not do things sometimes that is logical to our human reasoning. And this is why you have to know the word and you have to learn his voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And if that's not your priority, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? And, and, and just let me tell you right now, you want God to do big things in your life. You better obey him in the small things. I can tell you right now, our little church here reaches tens of thousands of people every week all over the world. But why is that happening now? It's happening because all the little steps the Lord gave me along the way, I would do what he said to do. And what's amazing is, too, when you are in his will for your life and doing what he wants, he will make sure you have what you need to do it. He will make sure you have the money or the vehicle or the land or the place or the people. He will provide what you need if you are in his will and obedient. You don't have to go through the word of faith. I'm going to put the Corvette picture on my, on my uh, refrigerator and I'm going to confess it until I get it. Let me tell you, that's witchcraft. The devil will bring your Corvette to you. He'll give it to you, make you think that you got it because you operated in faith. Now, that's not faith. 
Faith is not you deciding on something and just twisting God's arm till you get it. Faith, and this is what my, my pastor used to say. He used to say, faith is not a blind leap in the dark. It's not you deciding what you're going to do. He said, faith is obeying a word from the light. That's faith. See, a lot of people, I, I've pointed out for years, it talks about Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and James even says Abraham was justified or made righteous or made right in the sight of God when he offered up Isaac but see some people say well oh that's a that's works no let me tell you what it is how did Abraham know he was supposed to take Isaac and go on that mountain because Abraham had a relationship with God. And when he heard God and knew it was God speaking to him, Abraham would obey. That's why he's called the father of our faith. That's why it says the people who are children of faith are the same as the children of Abraham. That's why. And see, Abraham was 400 plus years before the law was ever instituted. He was an example of how we're supposed to have a relationship with God and walk in faith. Abraham would simply pray and seek God, and God would tell him, go leave here. Leave Ur of the Chaldees and go into the land of Canaan. Guess what? God didn't give him an explanation why. He doesn't have to explain to you. He doesn't tell you how it's going to end. For you to do it. You don't have to know everything. Somebody say, I don't need to know everything. Because if you knew everything, there would be no trust involved in this walk. And so when the Lord tells you to do something, you have to obey trusting, knowing that if I do what God wants me to do, even if it causes uproar and difficulties and people get mad and run this way and oh, mama moo and everything else. You know you will be in the best spot you can possibly be in. The safest place in the world to be is in the will of God. You need to know where you're supposed to work. You need to know where you're supposed to go to church. You need to know where you're supposed to live. You need to know who you should date or not date. You should know who to marry and not marry. You should be led by the Spirit. See, here's another thing. That's why people, when people marry the wrong person, because they don't listen to the Holy Spirit and they listen to their own flesh and emotions. And then, as the boy, you had this, if you get in sexual sin with a person, you're linking up and hindering that whole thing of being able to hear what God is saying to you. Which is another reason why God wants us to stay out of sexual sin so that we can hear his voice. You know, my, my nephew Ben is about to get married. Uh, and it's so wild. He's about to marry, you know, the Lieutenant Colonel, Brian Reed. Everybody know Brian? Remember from Skyfall? And he was my campaign manager as well. And... Uh, so, but it, what's wild is, is that we didn't introduce Ben and Mary. Ben decides I, he was moving up to North Alabama area to go to a church, ends up in the same church where she, now they're getting married on September 14th. But what I love, you know what they did when they started? They were so seeking God's will about whether it's God's will for them to be married or not. And I love uh, Chris and Brian. They've, they've raised their children to... Love the Lord, love the Word of God. I mean, they're just, we just love their family. And both of them, they started, you know, the right way, seeing each other with people around and the parents around. And, you know, they've kept themselves pure. And then they said, they, they, they were in the midst of their courting, we need to take six months away from each other and just pray and seek God to make sure it's not our emotions, not our feelings, and that it's the will of God for us. And after six months, they knew they just got stronger and stronger witness from the Lord that they were supposed to be married. And I think it back, I think, wow, what God has done in little Ben. I watch that little boy grow up. But you know, he had a powerful encounter with God, and he's given his God his whole life. And that's, that's, 
it, it, it's just beautiful when you do things God's way. Again, not without difficulty. There was not, he didn't say there would be no difficulty or suffering even in his will, but it's still the best place to be. Oh, man. You know all these stories I get to tell you? It's because I obeyed. I have these adventures because I obey. I get shot at sometimes because I obey. I get death threats because I obey. I have people write me and say, we love you. You've changed my life because I obey. You see? I can't imagine wanting to go through this life as a Christian and basically have done next to nothing except maybe attend church. And it doesn't mean everybody's called to be a pastor or a leader of a church. But guess what? We're all called to be the light of Jesus to this world. We're all called to preach the gospel. We're all called to lay hands on the sick and cast out demons. We're all called to be a light and a witness wherever we are to lead people to Jesus, not away from him. And we're called to help the church and to help Whoever, where, you know, whoever God makes your pastor, you're called to be a help, an assistance. It's not complicated. This is why I don't, you know, try to keep people here. I tell people, I've told people for 16 years now, it's about to be 16 year anniversary in January of this church. And I've told people, don't come here unless you know God sent you here. People t tell me to this day, still people all the time tell me, I'm going to move to Opelika so I can go to your... No, uh, uh. Now, most pastors, because they want tithes and numbers, are like, yeah, come on. Yeah, come on down. No. I don't want you here if the Holy Spirit wants you somewhere else. Because why would I be fighting against the Lord's plan? You understand? There, there's too much. Again, and that's another thing. If a pastor or church is motivated by numbers and money, they have departed from the faith. I'm just going to tell you right now, they're in idolatry. They're in idolatry, and the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, we're not even supposed to eat with idolaters. Mm. And it doesn't take too long. You want to go to a church for a little while, you'll find out if they're motivated by the word of God and preaching the truth or they're motivated by money and trying to build a big church. There's probably not a bigger idol in the church world than trying to be successful. Trying to have a big church, big ministry, big money. And I knew, I knew... I've known since I came back to Jesus at 19, that can never be your motivation. That's why I'm not afraid to tick y'all off. <laughs> because I'm going to preach the truth, and I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And if you don't like it, there's the door. <laughs> because I'm not trying to build a mega church. I'm trying to do what Jesus tells me to do. And so, guess what? That, that separates me from wanting to manipulate you or control you in any way. All I want y'all to do is obey the Word of God and obey the Spirit of God. If you do that, then we're all going to be blessed. And guess what? If you're doing that, if you're praying about everything and obeying the Lord and not your feelings and not your emotions and not what your opinions, if you're doing that, guess what? You're not going to be easily offended. You're not going to get your feelings hurt. Some people get mad at me sometimes. They're like, why did you preach that? Why did you say that? I'm like, I'm like, well, they, I mean, and the, like it may not even apply to them, right? Like I may be preaching about Drinking, getting drunk or whatever. And they don't get drunk, but they get all bent out of shape over it. And I'm like, well, if it's, you're not doing that, then guess what? I'm not talking to you. <laughs> right? But if the boot fits, right? I'm sorry. But that's just the way it is. Jesus made the statement when he was talking to his disciples early on. He said, I'm, I didn't come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. 
We got preachers saying you shouldn't even preach the word repentance. Christians don't have to repent. There's never repentance needed. I'm like, let me tell you, anybody do that? Why, why do I know? That is contrary to the word of God, the written word of God. It's contrary to what Jesus taught. And yet we got preachers saying that. Let me tell you, you hear somebody, a preacher, I don't care if he's on TV or in a mega church, and he says something stupid like that, he's departed from the faith because he doesn't respect the word of God enough to stick to it. Oh, somebody, amen or oh me. See, I'm getting down to the, the, the brass tacks this morning, right? See, all the outward show of Christianity, I, I'm not impressed by any of it. In fact, most of it is going to be cast into the fire. And most of the people in it are going to follow it into the fire. See, the Lord made it real clear. Go to Matthew. Matthew 7 real quick. I'm almost done. This is why Jesus made statements like this. Matthew 7. Verse 21. He said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Now, here's what's interesting about this, before I keep reading this. The verb saith here. Guess what verb tense it is? Guess what in my Hebrew keyword, Hebrew Greek keyword study Bible, PPT again, present participle. Ongoing, continuous action taking place. So he's saying there, these are people that are continually saying that Jesus is their Lord. Think about that for a minute. Continuously saying it. He said, not everyone that continuously says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, some people say, try to use this verse, say, oh, they never were saved. No, 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 hold on. Unsaved people can't cast demons out of folks. You have to be saved and have the authority and power of Jesus to cast a demon out of somebody. What he's saying here is that at some point they prophesied. They did prophesy in his name. Real prophecy. They really cast out demons. But at some point, they quit doing the will of God, meaning obeying the word, the scriptures, the written word, and being led by the Holy Spirit. At some, some point, they just said, I'm done with that. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. And what's interesting about this, he says, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Now, why does he say that? I never knew you. Why does that put in there? Because you go to Ezekiel 18, 30. 33, when he starts going through these verses, he says about those who, what? He says, when the righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him that he dies, he said, that righteous man, the things, the righteous deeds that he did will not be remembered. You know, just like God says, if you'll confess your sins and repent, turn away from them, that, that he will throw them in the sea of forgetfulness and he won't remember them. Right? Well, guess what? If you walked with him and you knew him and you cease obeying him at some point, guess what? All the good things you've ever done gets erased. Oh. Scary, isn't it? Scary verses in the Bible to scare the hell out of you so that you don't go to hell. Right? That's what we want. And some people, some people don't like I talk about I talk like this. You say, oh, I, 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 God demands obedience. I, I want to be free to do my own thing. That's really deep down man's problem, isn't it? 
But isn't it interesting when you decide you, I'm going to be free and do whatever I want to do, that it takes you into bondage. Well, I want to drink whatever I want, and the next thing you know, you're an alcoholic. Oh, I want to smoke marijuana, and the next thing you know, you're doing cocaine, meth. Oh, I want to, I want to have sex whenever I want to, and then you're killing babies with abortion. And you don't know every time you do these things, you're opening yourself up to demons that come in and take over, and you're, you're, you're just, you're getting more and more in bondage. Disobeying God leads to bondage. Obeying God leads to freedom. But see, a lot of people think freedom, freedom is doing whatever you want to do, that I'm free, I do whatever. No, that's called anarchy. There's always boundaries. Think about it. We, we have this country, America, and we're still free to worship, and we still have free speech most places. But what I'm saying, we enjoy all this, but think about it. If there was no law, if there was no enforcement of law, there has to be boundaries. Because if there's not a boundary, then then I can hurt you and get away with it. I've taken your freedom away. I've taken your peace away. I've taken your happiness. So that's why there has to be boundaries. There has to be law. There has to be limits. There has to be things we all about. I got people all the time, I ain't obeying nothing. I do what I want to do. I'm like, do you have a driver's license? Because you obeyed this. If you went and got a driver's license so you can drive without going to jail, Guess what? You just obeyed a law, a boundary. I do what I want to do. Really? You got a tag on your car? Now, we got some people, you got some crazies around here that don't want to go get a driver's license or put a tag on their car. And then they want to fuss when they get pulled over and get tickets and get put in jail. No, you don't do whatever you want, no matter what. You, you can run from Jesus, but you're still going to obey. You're going to obey, and guess what? If you don't, they will lock your behind up. And then you're going to eat when they tell you to eat, and you're going to sleep when they tell you to sleep. You want to talk about not wanting to obey these little boundaries, and then you find out, then they're going to put some real boundaries in your life, right? There's always going to be someone to obey. And see, the test of these last days is coming, it's coming down to this, whom will you obey? See, once the state goes over into making us try to do things that are not biblical, this is when we have to obey God rather than the men. I will not take the mark of the beast. I will not take another vaccine. I will not do certain things. I'm trying to be obedient to the government. I got a driver's license, got a tag on my car. I am trying to comply. As Christians, we should always try to comply and submit to authority as much as possible. But when that authority starts telling us to do stuff that God says you do not do, that's when we resist. But only then. You understand? And then if you go to jail because you've stood up for God and his word and his truth, so be it. He can send an angel and open up some, some prison doors and, and fall, let some chains fall off. You know, it's funny. He'll send you right back to where they arrested you. Obey. You know, after I obeyed the Lord and spoke in that Methodist church, I stood up finally. About three weeks later, I stood up and gave the word of prophecy God gave me to give to that church. It was simple. But like that was on a Sunday. The next day, I met with a group of my friends that were Christians, and we prayed together. And the Lord said, I want you to go to East Del Mall in Auburn and go preach the gospel to people. And we went to preach that night, obeying him. And the Holy Spirit fell, and we had nine people accept the Lord in tears running down their face. And I've shared that story. And the Lord told me, he said, when you obey me is when I move. 
When you obey me is when I pour out my spirit. Not before. And he does care about the little things. He that is what? He that is faithful in little will receive much. See, I've had God tell me to do all kinds. I've prophesied over governors and judges and God has sent me to people you wouldn't believe. The Lord has told me sometimes, here's a word for this person. Go meet with them and tell them what I said. And some of it's not pleasant. I had to tell, go tell one young man, you've had chance after chance after chance after chance to give your life to Jesus and get serious. And you know he's calling you. And the Lord wants me to tell you, you leave him one more time and you won't make it back. Your, your chances are over. I gave that word of prophecy in a church in Tamarine, Mauritius, to a young man who walked up at the end of the service, came up into the, the stairs, into the main room we were in where I was preaching, and I saw him, and the Lord told me to tell him that. I told him in front of the whole church and his pastor. He turned around and left, and the pastor came up to me and said, that's exactly what he's been doing. He got his last warning. So what I'm saying, it's not always pleasant. Sometimes the Lord is going to tell you, go talk to this person, go talk to that person. And sometimes it's, it's the warning is going to be, it's, it's not going to be a pleasant conversation. They might even get mad at you. They might even throw you out. They might even say, don't talk to me anymore, blah, 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 blah. But you've got to obey God. Somebody say, obey. obey. What did Jesus say about that? He said, if you what? If you love me, you will obey me. Basically, what he's saying is, I don't want to hear your talk. Talk's cheap. Do you live according to this book and what I tell you to do? That's it. That's what Judgment Day will be about. That's why it's a scary day. I want to do spirit lead me before we let's stand. This song to me has been speaking for a long time. I get my sword one more time. The sword of the spirit is what? The word of God. The sword of the spirit pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. What does that mean? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, either the written Word or the Holy Spirit speaking, cuts through what is Spirit-led and what will be soul-led. And you cannot be led by your soul. Your soul is your own mind, logic, reasoning, will, and emotions. You are not to be led by that. You are to be led by the Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit. I like that. Now, people, they don't like this because they're like, I don't want a sword in my life. It's there whether you want it or not. You're going to obey it or you're going to disobey it, but it's there. Some people know they're supposed to things they're supposed to obey before. They know before. They don't even have to have a preacher. I, it's people about to get in an adulterous affair. They know they're not supposed to do it. There's couples dating. They know they're not supposed to be in sex before they get married. But there they go. The sword's there. They know. They already know. The Holy Spirit's already convicted them in their heart. And then they just willfully disobey. And they wonder why all kind of crap happens. They wonder why they're depressed, why there's darkness over their soul and their mind, will, and emotions. It's because they're in disobedience. They're rebellious. They're dwelling in the dry land of the rebellious. God wants his people to live holy. And you know what the holy, holy simply means? 
set apart, sanctified, different, different than the rest of this world. Can somebody say amen? amen. Y'all get ready because God's got a new adventure for me coming. It's going to affect all y'all too, but there's a new adventure coming. It may be bigger than the last adventure. Right? You know, the Lord told me, I'll share this with you. So we can see what's going to happen. <laughs> but he told me that there was going to be something happen that was going to be even bigger than the, the debate in the amount of people it's going to affect in the world and in our country. So I don't know what he's about to do, but it's going to be big. And it's going to be fun. Somebody say it's fun, fun. to do the will of God. <laughs> Amen. Let's sing this song for you. Prayer. Holy Spirit, lead me. Lead me in your word. Lead me and help me obey your word, God. Your written word and your Holy Spirit speaking. We want to do your will, Lord. In all things, we want to be a people who obey. Because that's where the blessing is. That's where you pour out your spirit. That's where you move. That's where... God, you do mighty things. We want to be able to get to heaven and bring some people with us. We want to stand before you and say, Lord, I did your will for my life. And be like Paul and say, I, I, I kept the faith and I finished the course. The course that you gave him, he finished it, he said. Lord, we thank you that we can keep the faith and finish our course doing your will. We pray for your grace and your mercy and your help to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, the only announcements I have, Skyfall is still on. We're in LaGrange, Georgia now, back at the Callaway Conference Center, October 25th through the 27th. So we'll be there Thursday, setting up, signing up, and hanging out. So you're welcome to be there Thursday as well. We'll be here here at the church here in Opelika on that Wednesday, having our regular Wednesday night prayer meeting. So uh, just letting everybody know you can make plans if you want to be at the prayer meeting, you want to be uh, at the hangout. If you want to get here a little early, you're welcome to do so. Um, the hotels and everything are on the website, so you can look and find the hotels uh, you're about, uh, LaGrange is about an hour from the airport in Atlanta, so that's the best airport to fly into is Atlanta. Uh, you know, it's a city by itself, so, you know, just get used to that, you know. I like the little little uh, airports like in Montgomery and Springfield, Missouri, just little tiny airports. It's, those are nice, but but it, still, you can get out of Atlanta. At least the Atlanta airport is on this side of Atlanta and you can escape the airport and you're pretty well f free now to get over here to LaGrange and to Opelika. So, um, but that's it. So uh, y'all know the drill. Hug some necks before you leave. All right. God bless. <laughs>